they would like to build a very simple, let's say, one-page uh, uh, application where well, they collect data on a form. So this would be mobile. They already have the SQL database in place, uh, but they'd also like to have it be able to work offline. What is okay. – can you give us a demonstration of that? Yes. Um, I'll go ahead and show you how – I'm going to use the Northwinds database uh, as our example here. Yep. And I would show how, like, we would edit the customer table. Uh, so let me go ahead and do it so that you could do it effectively in a uh, offline manner. And by having right. your database already in place, that's a big jump. The that database really is already in place. Mm -hmm. and in the, right. Yeah, cool. And this person is very interested in data entry. This can be a data capture type of application. Okay. Cool. Um, let me go ahead and go into our development environment. And so for folks that are new to the alpha development environment, I am in the alpha uh, development environment, runs on Windows here. As people often ask, you're like, well, wait, that looks like a Mac. Well, I'm running Parallels uh, under my Mac so I can run Windows next to it. Really powerful, very easy to use. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and show you that, hey, I have an existing database, and it's a quote-unquote SQL database. In this case, it's Access, but it's any kind of SQL database that's available. And what I want to do is create a, a form uh, or a way to edit information in a table in that database in an offline uh, disconnected mode. And the cool thing about that is Alpha makes that really, really easy because of the built-in genies. So the first thing you need to know is that you first have to tell the development environment where is that data source? Where does it live? So I go to Tools, Alpha DAO Connection String. So before you do anything else, you need to tell the development environment where that, that database is and the kind of database. And you can have multiple. You're not limited to one. But I'm going to go ahead and click New, and I'm going to create a connection here. And the standard convention is C-O-N-N. That's kind of what we use in all our prototypes, demos, etc. Uh, the, there's many reasons, but just makes it easier. First one, always just name it that. You can name it anything you want. It's up to you. Then the next step is you click on the Build button next to the connection string, and you click Build. And that's going to bring up the uh, SQL connection string uh, window. Uh, and you'll notice that we have a whole series of different databases that are available pre-built in. And what's neat is coming soon, we're going to have what are called OData sources, which allows you to go against OData, OData web, API, web APIs. And also, we're going to be able to go against RESTful interfaces to web APIs, too. So this is really advancing for the Internet world really fast. But for now, with your situation, you would pick if it's MySQL or if it's SQL Server. You just pick whatever database you are in. And then once you have there, you'll be asked a series of questions to tell it. Like in the case of Access, it's saying, well, where's the file name? And it does it have a password. If it's MySQL, it's going to ask you where's it's hosted. Often for your development, it will be localhost. And then what's the username and password to log in? And then always click this test connection to make sure that you have a connection into that database environment. So once you've set up your connection string, you now have a connection string, and let me edit this here, and so I can test it and see, yeah, I can connect to that database, Alpha can talk to it. And that's always important to do that up front, because then you don't get into weirdness later on where you're building it and it's saying, well, I can't find the data source, yada, yada. Make sure that's solid. So that's step number one. And once you're done with that and you have your connection string, now I can start building my mobile interface. So in this case, it's going to be targeted for a phone, I'm assuming here. So I'm going to click New, and it's bringing up my selection of different things I can build. In this case, I want to build a web component that's used for both desktop, web, and mobile. I click Next. Then you'll notice I have a whole host of different things that I can do, and yours is going to be a little differently. Like I have some other secondary components, etc. But the thing we're looking for right now is a UX component. That's going to be your primary component for deploying your mobile user interface. So I select UX, and then I click Next. Now it brings up one of the better screens, which is the template screen. I could go ahead and click OK right now and create a blank UX component and lay it out from scratch, but I like to kind of make things go a little faster and also have something on the screen that I can then just adjust and modify accordingly. So you'll see we have a whole range of different built-in templates. But a good one I always like to start out with is a um, 
Mobile App Framework Panel Navigator with Tab Buttons. This one's just a good catch-all for especially a mobile interface, easy, ready to go out the face. There's some other ones that are in here. Uh, there is a sample disconnected app. By all means, open that and look at it, but it takes a bunch of more configuration to kind of get it running, so uh, it can be a little complex to go in there. But again, that's a great example of a full disconnected app there. Uh, but again, I tend to start with something very simple, and then I can enhance it as I need to go from there. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Mobile App Framework Panel Navigator with tab buttons, and now I'm going to click the OK button. So you'll notice it will immediately build a component for me. So you'll see it's already laid out the panel navigator, some panel cards, a panel footer, uh, all that set up. So I'm going to go ahead and save that, and let's call that uh, existing db uh, mobile dot, and I used the underscore ux to tell me it's a ux. So there, so I've saved that. Now I can go into my live preview and do a working preview immediately, and you'll notice as it compiles the first time. There we go. I have a mobile app and I can click on these buttons here and you'll notice that the panel content changes and it changes in different ways on purpose just to kind of give you a feel for how it works. So we have basically the rudimentary elements of a mobile app. It's kind of boring but it does work and it does those pieces there. So for this demonstration what I want to do is create a offline data entry for one of my tables in my system. And what I want to do is in this home button right here, I want a list of records and for the second button right here is where the detail when I'm editing a record. That's how I've structured it for this demonstration. So I'm going to click design. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to my panel card number one. That is the panel card when I click the home button is there. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that text in there and I'm going to put in the core of any disconnected database driven application which is the list component. So I'm going to go ahead and say I want to put on my first panel card a list because that list is going to be it's going to do two things. It's going to give me a visual representation for selecting records but also the list control completely handles all the offline mode data for you. That is how it kind of stores the data offline using the list control. Now that's now what's going on very rapidly with the next generation of Alpha's technology out a little later this year, it's actually in beta, is we're going to abstract that data from the list component. So we're going to actually have sort of think of it as a, uh, a data cache component that will exist that you can then reference controls to it. It's going to be very cool. It's going to make it much easier to do more complex apps. But for now, we use the list control when you're building an offline disconnected app that's the core of the system. So I'm going to go ahead and click on list control. It's asking me for the name. By the way, when you open this up it may look like this where it's creating a, a single list, but you can click here and if you want to create multiple. So I'm going to go list of customers, okay? So, oops, didn't turn off my thing, so ignore that. So I'm going to go list of customers here. Okay, so now I have a list of customers and it's an empty list. There's nothing in there, but it's going to be on my first panel card. So now we're ready to go ahead and configure that list of customers to tell it where it's going to get to its data, how it's going to lay it out, etc. So if you'll notice over in the right hand side, we have a um, we have the list of customers, and then we have where's the configure? We just double click on it to open up and configure that. So let me show you that again. Once I've added the list of customers, I double click on it and it opens up my Genie to configure that. Now, I could go through this here and manually put this together. I could tell it where I want to get the data from, SQL, uh, static, JavaScript function, etc., how to lay out the fields and stuff like that. But I like to cheat. So I'm going to go ahead and go out of here and delete this one for now. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to click um, list. I want to put in a list control there. But here's what I want to do is uh, I'm going to call this list of customers. But instead of going through it manually, you'll notice down below there's a button here called List Control Quick Setup Genie. So I click on that, and it opens up a different uh, dialog. 
And this is a quick and dirty dialogue to get everything set up. It's a genie that will configure everything. So the first thing it's asking you is where are we going to get our data from? And that's where this connection string comes in. So I'm going to click on the three ellipses here. I'm going to select one of my connection strings, in this case CONN, which is the one I designed to use for this. So now I've told it, okay, where am I getting my data from? So it goes, great. The next thing it's asking me is how am I going to get my data? In this case, I'm going to read fields from a specific table. Well, the question becomes which table? And again, since you already have an existing SQL structure, I'm going to click on here. It gives me a list of both my tables and views. So I'm going to click on customers. This will vary by your database, how your database is structured. So I click OK. So now I'm saying, OK, I'm going to use the connection string. I'm going to grab the information from the customers table. Now I'm, it's asking me, well, what fields do you want to bring back? Now, remember, we're using this to kind of both display and edit it. So I'm going to go ahead and bring back all the fields. So I click on the three ellipses here. And I go through and I select the different fields I want to do. I'm going to skip the image ones for today and off to the races. Now, I can set filter criteria, which is really powerful if you want to limit it to, you know, by their login, etc. You can set the order it's displayed in. You have a lot of flexibility on here, but I'm going to keep it simple and just say I'm going from this table and I'm bringing back this field list. Now, you'll notice next down below it says detail view. So this is the list. This is what's going to display the list to the user. Now we have a detail view, which is where they're going to be able to edit it. So I'm going to click the plus button here, and you'll notice that currently it's disabled. That means that I could go ahead and create this list, and it would just be a cool read-only list you could show on the screen. But I'm going to go ahead and click has detail view. And you'll notice that it opens up and adds a whole bunch of different parameters that are available for me. Um, the fields I'm going to use in there. In this case, it's saying give me all the fields, etc. For your purposes, start out with just selecting the the default, and then you can go in and change things as you see fit. Uh, but again, I, in this process, I can control how it basically builds my offline mode capability from there. Now, the other thing I want to do is if I wanted a search part, I could add that, but here is the magic. You'll notice it says disconnected operation. And currently, it is unchecked. So I'm going to check that. Boom, I'm done. Literally saved a week, couple weeks of work of setting up a local database and everything else. Bottom line is when you enable that, the system will automatically gather the data from the server, the database, store it locally, allow you to manipulate it locally, and then automatically synchronize that information back to the server, all by merely clicking this one little button, which is staggering. I mean, the time savings, we've had projects that we've gone on that people have gone down the road of using a third party, just you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript app, and they realize they need to do offline mode, and then they go back and say, yeah, three months from now we'll have offline mode run because of all the complexity that's involved in it. In this situation, all you have to do is click that one checkbox, boom, it's up and running. So we've got our list where we're getting our data from, we're including a detail view here, and we're telling it we want to be able to use it in offload mode. And I click OK, and in the next few moments, it automatically builds all the controls, it wires them up, puts them into organize, adds all the buttons, and I'm there. So as I said before, I want the list of customers to be in panel card number one, but I'm going to take this container with all of my detail view here, and notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to move it down, and it's a lot of control, so it takes a moment here, into panel card number two. Okay. So we've got panel card number one, which has the card all those pieces there, and then we have panel card number two, which then has the detail records that we're going to use. Now I want to do one other quick adjustment because I've done this before. When I go into list of customers now, we built this. If I go to list properties here, it's going to reopen that whole uh, genie I showed you before, our list builder. But you'll notice that everything has already been connected and put in there. It's got the data source set up, the fields, the list properties, the detail view, and then the list layout here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and modify this list layout to just get rid of a bunch of the fields because I know it won't look very pretty uh, when I have that. So let's go ahead and put there. So when it shows the list, and I can actually preview the list right now and see what it looks like. If I had a whole bunch of other fields, see what it looks like here. 
it gets noisy. And on a small phone, you're not going to want to see this on the phone. That's going to be really ugly there. So I'm just going to go ahead and only bring in three fields or so from there. So again, you can. this is what you've used. Once you've used that Gina to set it up, I can now go in here and control every aspect of how the user uses that technology or that list component in there. So now that I've got it, I'm going to click Save. And I'm going to go into Working. Uh, let's go into Live Preview. Okay. So in a moment, it's going to render that. Have to, there we go. So you'll notice, again, not exactly where I want it yet, but it looks pretty decent. You'll notice that it rendered a column or list. You'll notice that as I use my mouse to pretend I'm swiping, it's using the swiping generator there. If I click on one of these items, like uh, let's say Antonio, and let me scroll this down just a little bit here, and I go to here, you'll notice that Antonio is automatically populated in my detail view for me. So it's wired all that up. Let me go back to home. Let me click on Berglund's, go back to the detail view. There, It's all there. And you'll notice if I scroll up there, I've got all of my different information in here, including my buttons. So let's watch what happens now. So I'm on my home one. Let's go to Anna Chuyo. I go here, and let's say I want to change their region to uh, Texas region. Okay? So I've modified that, and I scroll it and click Save. You'll notice that it's now done a couple things. It's highlighted the synchronize button, and it's changed a few things there. Now, when I go back here, check out what it's done. You'll see that for Anna, it's put a little carrot right there, an orange carrot. What that means is that this record has been changed, but it has not persisted this data back to the back-end system, meaning that this data is local to the situation. And so if I want to go ahead and do that, I click Synchronize. And in a moment, you'll notice the Synchronize button now goes back to Disabled because you'll see there's no carrot because I've just created that back, or I've synchronized my local data to the back-end SQL database. And you'll notice I didn't write one piece of code. And that's the true power of this. Now, obviously, there's a bunch of things I want to change. First, when I click on here, I want it to automatically show me the detail. Secondly, I would probably lay out this screen so the buttons are maybe at the top, so I always have them available, so I have to do less there. But all of that is just sort of nuances that you can now do behind the scenes. You can start laying out your screen using the techniques I talked about before. You can move these buttons around. Uh, you can go back to the list and make this look a lot nicer. Instead of columnar, you can make it like, you know, a, a, a vertical-oriented list.